The reading for today comes from James chapter 4. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you are asked wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or you do suppose it is no purpose that the scripture says he earns jealousy over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Let me pray and then I want to bring to you what I have prepared this day. Lord, I thank you. May in your mercy visit this church and the people who call this home that we may be your people who know Jesus Christ, live his life with each other and the community that you've called us to witness to and be part of. May your grace abound this day and Holy Spirit, you're the master teacher. Come, in Jesus' name, amen. Alex Spanos uh, was the owner of the San Diego, now Los Angeles Chargers. And he passed away this last week or a week ago or so. And uh, he started out with $800 in 1950. And he turned that $800 into about, oh, like, I think something like $3 billion towards the end of his life. But his obituary reads in some ways as a, uh, testament to how tough even billionaires have life or if sometimes we think people have money don't have problems but it's very obvious that billions don't keep problems away from people alexander gus spanos was born september 28 1923 in stockton california where his father ran a restaurant and bakery alex and his brothers rose at 4 a.m to help bake bread and pastry before the school he recalled in a memoir sharing the wealth, during World War II, he served in the Army Air Forces. Afterwards, his father wanted him to study engineering, but the younger Mr. Spanos dropped out of what is now the University of Pacific and rejoined the family bakery at $40 a week. Married and with a growing family at the age of 27, he demanded a raise. When his father refused, he quit the job. His father didn't speak to him for nearly two years and told him, he would never amount to anything. Of course, if you become a billionaire, in some ways, he amounted to something, correct? But listen to this. In business, he wrote, he exceeded his wildest dreams. One sorrow lingered. His father died in 1976 without ever congratulating him who by that time, Alex Spanos was worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and his father never said, good job, son. What stuck with him? That he made a bunch of money? Isn't it amazing? He's 54 years old when his dad dies, and that's the thing he regrets most. Because we're made for relationships, and relationships have conflict and tension in them. Conflict and tension is also a time to bear fruit. And what kind of fruit has to do with whether the life situations are handled in our human pride or whether they're handled under the grace of God? You will bear fruit. Alex Spanos bore fruit 
But I don't think Alex Spanis' father may have known how his silence so hurt his son. And like I said, relationships are the most powerful thing in our life by far. God created us for relating to him and to each other and to ourselves. Yet, then again, you ask the question, as this series is talking about, why does it seem like people, you and I, why is it, does it seem like we just have so many conflicts? I had uh, Alice read to us this morning from James chapter 4. Why are there so many conflicts? James says, why this will source of your quarrels and conflicts. Is not the source of your pleasures which wage war in your members? So he says, yeah, that's why. That's why you have them. But it's interesting he uses that word, in your members. Now, is that talking, because members in Scripture can mean just parts of our body, which Paul then uses as a metaphor for the church and all the members of the body. And that seems to be what James is doing here. In Ephesians chapter 5, we see this, Ephesians 5, 30 through 32, that we are members of his body. And as a church... We are members of his body, Jesus Christ. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, we always use this in marriage, you know, marriage ceremonies, things like that. Very true. But Paul's purpose in bringing this out here was this mystery is great. I'm speaking of with reference to Christ in the church. We're members of his body. So all of you who name Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior out there today, you are members of his body, but you look around and all the people around you are the same thing. They're members of his body. So if there's conflicts among you, it's the members warring with each other. And then you ask, well, why would that be? I went to visit my brother down in Iowa. He was the first time I've seen him in five years. He came from Seattle to see my sister, so I snuck down there to go see him, and he didn't know I was coming. It was great. It was hard. It was... You know, it's one of those family things. But we got reminiscing, and we had an old uncle named Leroy. And Leroy used to come when I was a little boy. He'd take my arm like this, and he'd start whacking me in the face with my arm. And then he'd ask this really simple question. What are you hitting yourself for? Well, in some ways, I could take that back to, in, a, in a church setting, too. You know, if we start hitting each other, what are you doing that for? You're hurting yourself. But I don't deny, cannot deny, that in a church there will be conflict. And in relationships there's going to be conflict. So then it becomes important not to say, oh, we want no conflict. It becomes important to know what to do when the conflict comes and how to handle it in a Christ-honoring way because we're members of his body. So we shouldn't be picking on each other in that way. But he goes on, if we back up in this, we did this a couple weeks ago, or maybe it was last week, in James chapter 3, we pick up on this idea of why are there so many conflicts. James chapter 3, verse 14, I'll start verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. There's no way around the fact that you have to live life by deeds. What you do, who you are, shows up in your conduct. So then he says, why are there so many conflicts? He says this, but if you are bitter, jealousy, and selfish ambition in your heart, don't be arrogant and so lie against the truth. Face the facts that the conflict comes many times because of jealousies and selfish ambitions. And he says, don't be arrogant. It's kind of fun because this word arrogant, do not be arrogant. And it'll come later in chapter 4 as well. It comes from the Greek word of to boil. How many of you have ever used the term, that burns me up? That's kind of the idea behind arrogance. That burns me up. It comes in, a, it makes your blood boil. Like, this is wrong, you know. And it can be, and we're going to see here in a second, that it's not always bad. Jealousy is not always bad because it says that God himself is jealous. Things that make God's blood boil? <laughs> yes, very true. So what's the antidote? What's part of the antidote? Romans chapter 13, we read this. Oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another. For you who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Now, many people take that as don't go into debt with anybody, and that's not what I'm here for today. 
For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. If there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. What's the antidote for conflict? Part of it is to remember the commandments, almost all the commandments, all the Ten Commandments are relational oriented to God and to each other. So there's some churches that love to use the slogan, love God, love others. It's not a bad slogan, because it's not a slogan. It's actually a teaching of Scripture. But what is it that causes these conflicts then? And the antidote, again, is to take a good look at your neighbor. And remember, your neighbor is pretty close to you in same things. Romans 13, 14 then says this. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ, make no provision for the flesh, in regard to its lusts. So again, we saw last week that flesh is that part of us that, that loves to stay in rebellion against God. It comes natural to us to be in rebellion against God for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. So we all have that kind of rebellion built into us. But we don't have to feed it. I had a couple of you talk to me last week after church, which I love, you know, about the idea of the flesh and two dogs, you, you feed the one, you don't feed the other one. You know, whatever, whatever it takes for you to understand that your flesh is not your friend. And the only thing you can do with your flesh, this broken part of us, is to keep taking it to the cross. Keep taking it to the cross and crucifying it. But I want to see a little bit more about this antidote, I would say, of conflict. Some, there's some things that need to, we take the flesh into account when we're, when we're talking about conflict always. I don't believe you can find conflict, between, I'll just use between two Christian brothers or sisters. I don't think you can find it without there being some form of the old flesh still operational that needs to be handled in some ways. So it brings me to this place where when we're dealing with conflict, when we're dealing with the flesh, there's an important element that we must become self-aware. And it's counterfeit. There's self-awareness, which I think is a good thing. It's counterfeit, just like counterfeit money. It's bogus. It's not good. But it sometimes buys things. You, you, every once in a while you'll hear, I heard we had some counterfeit money floating through Ashland here a few weeks ago. Somebody unsuspecting, you know, bought, you know, $20 bills and brought, you know, people, merchants were like, I've lost. This is bogus. So self-awareness is a good thing, but it's counterfeit. Being self-absorbed is not. And being self-absorbed, there's a big difference between them. The clue comes in, in James chapter 4, some of the differences between these two things. Self-absorbed is not the good thing. Self-awareness is. So we read as we come in James chapter 4 again, you lust and do not have, verse 2, you commit murder. Now, I don't think James was necessarily meaning the physical bodily murder. It could have been, maybe. I hope not. You are envious and cannot obtain. And, of course, that has everything to do with the, the 10th commandment. Thou shalt not covet. Remember, all those commandments are for us to look upon other people and bless them. You got a brand new car. I've got this old clunker. To God be the glory, you've got a new car. You've got this nice house, and I've got this old shack here. Praise God. I'm glad for your nice house. See, in, the, in those commandments... It opens the door up for us to see our neighbor as somebody under God's rule, just as we are. And this is really important. But what we have in James chapter 4, we read this. And he says, James never pulls back. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship of the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself to be an enemy of God. Well, many times the way that we're in the world system, if you want to put it that way, is that we operate by its rules. And the world system is all about self-absorption and self-interest. Watch out for number one. What does a Christian say? A Christian says, I live for number one. And we pull out of self-absorption, but we are self-aware. 
One of the blessings that I get from Scripture is this, is that God has put the order of the world together because he's creator. So he put it together and how it works, the human being and, and the human and the human genome, you could say, the human psychology, he put those things, he made us in his image. So he put it together. And as a believer, we get, we get this leg up from the world around us, how the world works. And then we get to not be over people, we get to be among the people of the world as the people of God. We are to be, in some ways, salt and light. I heard that this morning. That's what we're supposed to be. And we're salt and light when we are alive to God and when we are functioning by his ways, when we are walking in his ways. That's when we have our greatest effect. What tends to dumb that effect down? That's when we have our petty jealousies and self-absorbed things, things like that. Jealousy is usually assigned a negative quality, but we see it in James chapter 4 in a positive quality. Verse 5, or you think the scripture speaks to no purpose. Many people do, but here's what it says. He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. And then this amazing connection that he makes what we need, but he gives greater grace so that we can learn to walk in a way that does not become self-absorbed, but rather self-aware, which is good, but aware of God as well. So I'm just going to pause real quick here. Just some simple steps to be applied when conflict shows up. So I'm doing some application before I come to the end of this message, but I just felt it was important just to make some practical observations on handling conflict. As a general rule, there's all kinds of conflict. There's all kinds of them. But as a general rule also, when you are faced with conflict, tap the brakes. So I'm using a dry analogy. Don't slam on the brakes. You tap the brakes. So you tap the brakes a little bit and you slow down. If you can train yourself when conflict, when you can feel this stuff starting to get up inside you first thing is a good driving instructor will tell you when something's happening out in the highway and you don't know what's happening what's the first thing you do slow down so when you feel this stuff inside you starting to come into a kind of your kind of your fight mode slow down tap the brakes number two stay awake look around inside and outside make sure you look inside yourself a little bit and go why why at this point in time is this seem to be important for me why do i need to win or fight here what's what's going on here be self-aware realize what's going on so stay awake stay awake to the surroundings around you number three recognize what's happening in the cars these days you know in the old days you had a bunch of gauges you know, your amps and you had your oil pressure and your heat and all this stuff. I'm sure in Kenny's big trucks, they still got all these nice little gauges and stuff. We hoi polloi drivers now have what's called idiot lights. Right? What's an idiot light? If it comes on, what are you supposed to do? So I've got six daughters that I've taught how to drive. They didn't like my, my technique of teaching them how to drive, but that's beside the point. When that red light comes on stop or you're not going to have an engine anymore or you're not your brakes are, are gone or something like that but there is again you got to recognize in conflict what's happening when the idiot lights come on pay attention and back off now i wish i could say it was a perfect i i have practiced this I have been practicing this. God gave me a wife, and she gave that wife as a husband. I've conflicted with her, and she with me probably more than anybody in the world. But don't, don't see that necessarily as a bad thing. I feel like Angie and I have also grown up as parents. We treated our oldest daughter differently than we treated our youngest daughter because we grew up. But we practiced. We didn't stop practicing and we're still practicing. 
You can't stop practicing dealing with conflict. You have to. And the fourth thing in, in some simple ways of looking at these, you need to stop, back up, and shut up, usually. Because a lot of times, the best thing you can do when you get into conflict is shut your mouth. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Don't feed the fire. But, 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 I want to win. What's conflict all about, really? I want to win. Those poor Packers, they had a tie game this year. Makes them feel terrible. They'd almost rather have probably had a loss, right? Yuck, tie game. <laughs> when you're in conflict, usually it's the idea, I want to win. So recognize that. But recognize what you might be winning may not be what you like to get. We're prone to be inflate, have an inflated sense of our importance, and we tend to leave God out of the picture. When it comes to conflict, we tend to inflate our position and our importance. I'm not saying, especially since we are people who, who treasure this, I'm not saying that we back down from conflict when it comes to the Word of God, but as people who know the Word of God, we above all people need to know how to do conflict right. And many times what we try to do is we try to do God's fight for him because we tend to have an inflated sense of our own purpose and ability. The most vital perspective in conflict, as important as self-awareness is, is a healthy God-awareness. And for us, Christ-awareness. Hebrews 13, 5 through 8, we read this. Make sure your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and consider the result of their conduct. Imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And as far as I can tell, he's with me and you, whatever the conflict that comes to your way. So if you think about it, if you begin to have a shouting match with a fellow believer or you begin to have a shouting match with your husband or your wife, is there a third person in the room if you seem like you're the only two there? You're not. And so what we need to do is become much, much more aware of our Savior's presence in our conflicts as well. Verse 9 in Hebrews 13 goes on. I didn't put it down here. Don't be carried away by varied and strange teaching, for it is good for the heart to be, I love this, to be strengthened by grace. See, grace is what we grow in. Grace isn't just what we get saved by. Grace is also the lifestyle of growing and walking with the Lord and gain the benefits of it. But there's always an echo in in conflict, there's always this echo that's there. Um, we listen to it, and this, this echo is that God is present. We need to hear that, that God is present, and depend on him, and look to him, find the strength in him in the midst of those... Don't you think the scripture speaks to a purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. He gives a greater grace, therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That is a good fighting verse for us. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So again, it should pull us back in conflict, allowing for the presence of God. We have a dog named Tucker. Tucker's getting old. We have two staircases in our house. We have an old house, and so we have a staircase that comes off the kitchen, goes up the back part of our house upstairs. We have a staircase that goes down to the front door. The front door one has carpet on it. It has a runner on it. And we decided a long time ago, even though it's kind of a losing war, dog hair is everywhere, Tucker cannot use the front steps, the one with carpet on it. His favorite place to sleep in our house is on our bed. So when the doorbell rings, that's at the front door. But we've trained him 
so that when that doorbell rings, he can bark his head off, but which steps does he go down? He goes down the back steps. The fastest way to the front door is the front steps, but he goes down the back steps. Every once in a while, something overpowers his training, and he just bounds down the front steps, and all I have to go is, I go, Tucker! And he goes, he did wrong. Are we going to are we going to succeed in every conflict, and and be able to say that hey we're really good at this? No. There's times our our old flesh is going to overpower us. But I'm telling you, don't stop training. Work at it. Grow in the grace of God in it. Find a way in which we depend upon Him. We are prone to an inflated sense of our importance. And the scripture calls that arrogance. I read on the opposite side of another obituary of a man who died just a few days after Alex Spanos. I read about William Coors, 102 years old, Coors Beer out in Golden, Colorado. It's interesting that he took the Ten Commandments and he added number 11. And I want to try to show you this a little bit, what I saw here. His 11th commandment. William Kistler Coors was born August 11, 1916 in Golden, Colorado. His grandfather, Adolf, a Prussian immigrant, founded the company in 1873 and killed himself in 1929 by jumping from a hotel window. William's father, Adolf Jr., was a strict disciplinarian, the son recalled later. We did things his way, period. So the father sends him off to school in the east. He goes to a school, and this is interesting. Uh, in the school, actually, he went to not college. He actually went to what they called prep school. So it would be like sending your fifth or sixth grader off to a boarding school out east. And in Latin class, Williams, um, he, he had a Latin teacher who declared to Mr. Coors, Coors, you are a crow among swans. Is that uplifting? No. So he had this constant tension with his dad and expectations of how he was supposed to do things. And then he got married, and he had a son. And when his son was 20 months old, that son died by choking on a bone. And so then Mr. Coors started to drink a little bit too much of his product. And it says here, amid all this family tragedy, he said later, I began to fail, became non-functional, wasn't sleeping, had no appetite. The family sent him to Mayo Clinic where doctors found nothing wrong with him physically. Mr. Coors concluded he had to find his own cure. Shunning medication for his depression, he turned to alternative medicine and daily meditation. Compassion for others was vital, he told high school seniors in 1981 speech, but so was self-esteem. He offered them all the 11th commandment, thou shalt love thyself. Now, in and of itself, that doesn't sound bad. And our world around us is full of that commandment, love yourself. But it doesn't because, again, we are created by a living God and, and who's in control of how his creation. What tends to happen when we love ourselves, we tend to become absorbed with ourselves. And we tend to become ignorant of God and arrogant among other people. See, it doesn't take much to twist scripture. It doesn't take much to twist it. But that twist can take people in, in a direction that is not good. There's a need for self-awareness and God-awareness and watching for the tendency of self-absorption, which Scripture calls arrogance. And then I just got, I want you to listen to, this is, this is dry technical stuff in some ways from a, a word study, but this comes from Help Ministries. Elizonie, which is the word that we translate arrogance, is properly a vagabond, quack making empty boasts about having cures to rid people of all their ills, even by producing wonder. Take this pill and it'll make you this or it'll make you that. 
There's been a lot of quackery. In other word studies, from Strong's word studies, arrogance is this, an insolent and empty assurance. This is what arrogance is. An insolent and empty assurance which trusts in its own power and resources and shamefully despises and violates divine laws and human rights. Arrogance is, again, we see in James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. You're familiar with this story. Come now, you say today, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, engage in a business, and make a profit. We see it all the time. I see it every day. Plans made. Going to do this, going to do that. What are you going to do next, what are you gonna do next year? I always ask kids that. What do you ask a kid when he graduates from high school? What are you going to do next? I, it's just part of our language, and it's okay. There's nothing wrong with it if we continue on where it says, you don't know about your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it to him is sin. And what it's talking about there is, if you know it's life is not to be lived by arrogance and you still live in arrogance, not good. So I was trying to think, how can I give a good picture of arrogance? And that's where the story of Rabshakeh comes in. So if you've got your Bibles, we'll go really quickly in 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19. Rabshakeh, there, now there's a term you can take home with you today. Rabshakeh. I'm probably even pronouncing it wrong. Too bad, I'm the one up here saying it. 2 Kings... 18 is about the story of one of the good kings of Judah, Hezekiah. But it's also one of the best places in Scripture, a biblical picture of arrogance, this puffed-up sense of self-importance, especially this sense of, of being able to despise divine authority. So Rabshakeh is actually a term. They don't know if it means chief cupbearer or if it means chief of staff. But Rabshakeh was the guy just underneath Sennacherib, who was the king of Assyria at the time. Assyria was in its ascendancy as a world power at this time. And Assyria has uh, come and taken the ten tribes north and conquered them, taken them out of the land, and distributed them in the kingdom of Assyria. Judah is holding on. And uh, we read in chapter 18, verse 5, about Hezekiah, verse 4, he says, He removed the high places, he's a good king. He removed the high places, broke down the sacred pillars, cut down the Asherah. He also broke, in, this is interesting, he also broke down the pieces of the bronze serpent that Moses had made. Isn't it interesting? They've been carrying this thing around for centuries. For until those days, the sons of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan, piece of bronze. But Hezekiah saw it for what it was, it had become an idol. This thing that God had given them at one point in their history, they had kept their eyes on it and not on him. We keep our eyes on our Savior. But it goes on to talk about Hezekiah. He trusted the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor among those who were before him. For he clung to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. Now that sounds just absolutely amazing. Because, we then read, he wasn't always aware of the idiot lights. And he made some bad choices. Let me ask you, brothers and sisters. Do you ever make bad decisions still? Does he still love you? Yes. Keep coming back. And keep your expectations in him and walking with him. So one of the things that Hezekiah, uh, he's got great character, but he has an oops. Chapter 18, verse 13 through 14 talks about, it gives a little bit of, it, this fills out in Isaiah as well. But what, back in that day, there were alliances made, and Hezekiah made some alliances because they saw Assyria was a big power and coming into power. And what do you do if you've got big power coming in? You go find some buddies to come up against that power. Does that still happen in the world today? It happens all the time. Alliances and all these kinds of things. This is how men work. 
But what it really was was in some ways a slip up for, for Hezekiah because he started to depend on who? God or Egypt? In this case, Egypt. Well, the funny thing is, Assyria went around his backside, defeated Egypt, took him out of play, and then shows up at Jerusalem's door and knocks on his door. So here's a good king, but Rabshakeh comes, and things are not looking so good. And so Rabshakeh shows up in chapter 18, verse 17, the king of Syria sent Tartan and Rabsaris and Rabshakeh from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a large army to Jerusalem. So they went up, came to Jerusalem, and when they went up, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is on the highway of the Fuller's Field. So again, Scripture sets it in place. But Rabshakeh says in verse 19, they, um, basically Hezekiah sends his guys out to talk. Rabshakeh's got his guys around him to talk. But Rabshakeh knows that he's got the upper hand. He's got this huge army. But he's arrogant. Absolutely arrogant. Rabshakeh said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, verse 19, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What is this confidence that you have? You say, but they're only empty words, I have counsel and strength for war. Now on whom do you rely that you have rebelled against me? Now behold, you rely on the staff that crushed reed, even on Egypt, on which if a man leads, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who rely on him. But if you say to me, we trust, and here's the amazing thing, if we, you tr we trust in the Lord our God, and he at Rabshakeh invokes God's covenant name. It, and so this again, did, did, were people aware of the Lord? Absolutely. Are people aware of the Lord today? Absolutely. Don't forsake that. They just don't get him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and has said to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Interesting. Rabshakeh gets the idea that Hezekiah came in and took all the high places away, which were a stumbling block to Judah and to Israel. He was a good king. And Rabshakeh saw that he did this. But what Rabshakeh didn't get was that who commanded that they worship only in Jerusalem? Lord God Almighty. And all Hezekiah did was try to put that back in order again. Now therefore, come make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses if you're able on your part to set riders on them. How then can you repulse one official of the least of my master's servants and rely on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Have I now come up without the Lord's approval against this place to destroy it? The Lord, again, Rabshakeh takes the covenant name of God. The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Don't be surprised when non-believers twist things. Don't be surprised. But be careful you don't get drawn into the conflict with them in such a way as you're trying to fight on your own power. This was tough times for the people here. Because what Rabshakeh did was, instead of using Aramaic, which was the, the Franco lingua of the region, the whole place, he basically probably spoke in Hebrew in the hearing of the people on the wall. He was using psychological warfare upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, shouting very loudly these words. Now those officials that Hezekiah had sent said, don't, 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 don't speak that way. Calm down. Calm down. He basically said, there's no way you get to survive. You're going to drink your own urine and, drink and eat your own poop, basically. That's what he said. But... Just like in your conflicts and our conflicts, we've got to remember who's the third person we always need to include. Include him. Chapter 19 gives a little twist to the story because Hezekiah's plan, how is he going to do this? Hezekiah's plan is kind of fun. Verse 9, chapter 19, King Hezekiah heard it. He tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, entered into the house of the Lord. 
Brothers and sisters, we can do in some ways the same thing when we find ourselves in conflict. We get down on our knees and cry for mercy. We humble ourselves. He then sent Eliakim, who was over the household with Shebna, the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth to Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amoz. They said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of distress, rebuke, and rejection. For the children have come to birth, and there is no strength to deliver. It is bad. The situation is bad. But these were Hezekiah's words to Isaiah through these men that he sent. Perhaps the Lord your God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh. Interesting. Did you get that? Whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to reproach the living God and will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, offer prayer for the remnant that is left. So Hezekiah does the best thing when he, this big major problem faced him. Because he had messed up in some ways. He had made some alliances that he shouldn't have made. He repents. And he humbles himself. And he puts on sackcloth and ashes. Which is a way of saying, I have no strength for this. So, in chapter 19, verses 8 through 13, which I won't go into too far at this point, but basically what happens is that Rabshakeh gets wind that something is happening with his master, Sennacherib, so he, he knows he needs to take off. But he basically gives a parting shot to Hezekiah and to Jerusalem, says, don't worry, I'll be back. And when I get back here, it's over. So again... Hezekiah's prayer goes up in verses 14 through 19. We get that recorded here. But I want to focus on what God says. And that comes in chapter 19, starting at verse 20. Then Isaiah, the son of Amoz, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Because you have prayed to me about Sennacherib, king of Syria, I have heard you. Uh, Real quick, I'm going to point something out here. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust, do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. There's something in the way that Hezekiah approached Isaiah And then Isaiah comes as the mouthpiece of God back to Hezekiah that shows that he came and he asked with the right motives. He asked in humility and he cried out for mercy and he was willing to lay before God. This is what the word that the Lord has spoken against him. This is about Sennacherib. So let me make sure I put this in the right context. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, because you have prayed to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard you. This is the word that the Lord has spoken against him. This is the king Sennacherib. She has despised you and mocked you, the virgin daughter of Zion. She has shaken her head behind you, the daughter of Jerusalem. Whom have you reproached and blasphemed? And against whom have you raised your voice? And haughtily lifted up your eyes, which is arrogance, against the Holy One of Israel. Through your messengers you have reproached the Lord, and you have said, With my many chariots I came up to the heights of the mountains, to the remotest parts of Lebanon, and I cut down its tall cedars and its choice cypresses, and I entered its farthest places, lodging places, and its thickest forests. I dug wells and drank foreign waters, and with the sole of my feet I dried up all the rivers of Egypt. I did these things, Sennacherib says through Rabshakeh. But this is just God quoting them. Does God listen to you? (laughs) Can God quote you? Isaiah goes on with the word of the Lord. Have you not heard? Question mark. Long ago, Different I, I did it. From ancient times, I planned it. That you should turn fortified cities into ruinous heaps. 
You mean God used Sennacherib for his own purposes? Yes. Now, I, I believe I can do this. I believe I can trust my God that he uses Putin, Xi Jinping, for the time he was on earth, Fidel Castro. He uses all these things in his purposes, in his plans. Do I understand it and comprehend it? I do not, completely. I am not his master. He does not answer to me. But I am supposed to answer to him, am I not? Am I not supposed to walk with him and put away arrogance and put on humility and let him use me? I believe we are. Therefore, their inhabitants were short of strength. They were dismayed and put to shame. They were as vegetation of the field and as green herb, as grass grows in the housetops and as scorched before it's grown up. But I know you're sitting down, you're going out, you're coming in, you're raging against me. Because of your raging against me and because of your arrogance has come up to my ears, therefore I will put my hook in your nose, my bridle in your lips, and I will turn you back by the way which you came. And the way he did that was he sent one angel that killed 185,000 men in one night. And it's almost like the story in the Bible is so subdued there. It just says, he went out and killed 185,000 guys. Next. I know it's not that simple. And I know that um, conflict and the things that go with it are not that simple. But when God speaks about how we're supposed to handle conflict, I think we should listen. And usually one of the first things that we have to recognize in conflict is we have to look for any arrogance in our part. That place that we put ourselves in a superior position over the other person. We've got to watch for it. Arrogance tends to be in and around all conflicts. Wasn't it arrogant for Hezekiah to trust God then? No. It's arrogant not to trust him. Our unbelief is arrogant. We tend not to trust God. That's arrogance. The major conflict that settles all conflicts is a war between the wills. And that is God wills and I will. That tends to be the, the balancing point of conflict. God wills, I will. And we need to align with that wills there. You don't have to be a big shot, a, a billionaire. You don't have to be most intelligent person. You don't have to be born into a superior family. You don't have to be born into a high class family. You can be poor, insig seemingly insignificant, and still be arrogant with God. And therefore, even do, do arguments only happen between rich and powerful people? Talk to a police officer sometimes. If you went and talked to, I bet you any police officer in Washburn or Ashland, when they get pulled into domestic disturbances, are most of the people wealthy? Probably not. So then what's the, what's the root of the arguments usually? Well, we like to say it's, well, it's drugs, it's alcohol, it's, you know, family systems or whatever it is. But really, in that somewhere in there is arrogance. This is a, a very short little thing that C.S. Lewis wrote called Three Kinds of People. Just listen carefully. There are three kinds of people in the world. The first class is of those who live simply for their own sake and pleasure regarding man and nature as so much raw material to be cut up into whatever shape may serve them. In the second class are those who acknowledge some other claim upon them the will of God, the categorical imperative, or a good society. And I would say today, I would put, insert their humanity. And honestly try to pursue their own interests no further than this claim will allow. They try to surrender to the higher claim as much as it demands, like men paying a tax, but hope like other taxpayers that what is left over will be enough for them to live on. Their life is divided 
like a soldier's or a schoolboy's life, into time on parade or off parade, in school, out of school. But listen to this. But the third class is of those who can say, like St. Paul, that for them to live is Christ. These people have got rid of the tiresome business of adjusting the rival claims of self and God by the simple expedient and rejecting of claims of self altogether. The old egotistical will has been turned around, reconditioned, and made into a new thing. The will of Christ no longer limits theirs. It is theirs. All their time in belonging to him belongs also to them, for they are his. And because there are three classes, any merely twofold division of the world into good and bad is disastrous. It overlooks the fact that the members of the second class, to which most of us belong, are always and necessarily unhappy. That's really powerful. The tax which moral conscience levies on our desires does not, in fact, leave us enough to live on. As long as we are in this class, we must either feel guilt because we have not paid the tax or the pen or penury poor because we have. The Christian doctrine that there is no salvation by works done according to the moral law is a fact of daily experience. Back or on, we must go. But there's no going on simply by our own efforts. If the new self and the new will does not come at his own good pleasure to be born in us, we cannot produce him synthetically. The price of Christ is something, in a way, much easier than moral effort, is to want him. It is true that the wanting itself would be beyond our power, but for one fact. And the world has built that to help us desert our own satisfactions, they desert us. That's his way of saying that I don't know what Spanos and Coors great desires were, but if money was their desire, they had a lot of it, and what deserted them on their death day. War and trouble and finally old age take from us one by one all those things that are natural self hope for in its setting out. Begging is our only wisdom, and want in the end makes it easier for us to be beggars. Even on those terms... Mercy, meaning God, will receive us. I don't know why God put upon me to bring a message series on conflict. I think it's just because it comes so natural to us. But it's also this place where we can learn to depend on him and get shaped and formed into a character like our Savior, Jesus Christ, who it says was reviled yet he did not revile in return. So my desire for us, Grace Bible Fellowship, is that we be a place where the Spirit of God inhabits us, to use us. And somehow for this place to be a place where it doesn't just stop with us who sit here right now, but that God in his mercy will deal with arrogant people that don't live here right now or call this home. Bring them to see their arrogance, their unbelief, and turn away from it and look to him in mercy. And he loves to be merciful. Our God loves to be merciful. Amen? Again, Lord, I come. Uh, I lay this before you. I lay this before the people here. I don't know what people will take. I pray that they bring something away from this to look into their life and to line up with you. If nothing else, Lord, may we recognize always your presence. Jesus Christ is the same today as yesterday and tomorrow. Be merciful to us, Lord, for that is what we need. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.